By the early 1970s, the horsepower race was in full swing. Farmers wanted more. Wider implements, faster fieldwork, and tractors that wouldn't hesitate under a heavy load. For International Harvester, that meant stepping into the world of high-horsepower four-wheel drives with something bold, something that would grab attention and torque. What they came up with was the DV800. It was a V8 turbocharged diesel. The DV800, or DVT800 as it was known on the CED side of things, packing nearly 800 cubic inches of displacement and delivering between 300 and 350 horsepower, depending on the version the tractor was installed in. Just the sight of it under the hood of a 4568 or 4586 was enough to turn heads. Big block V8s weren't new in trucks or construction equipment, but putting one in a farm tractor was still a novelty, and IH was banking on it to change the game. Today, we're focusing on how this engine performed in agriculture because that's where its story really took a turn. This wasn't just about making power, it was about making a statement. Competitors like Steiger and Versatile were using Cummins and Caterpillar six-cylinders to get the job done. But IH wanted something different. They wanted their own engine, built in-house with the kind of presence that made dealers proud and farmers curious. On paper, the DV800 had the numbers, but specs don't always tell the whole story. What really mattered was how it held up in the dirt, how it started on a cold morning, how it pulled under load, and how many days it spent parked in the shed waiting on parts. This is the story of the DV800, a big engine with big expectations, launched at a time when IH needed a win, but got something else entirely. International Harvester didn't just set out to build a bigger engine. They set out to engineer something that would redefine their place in the high horsepower market. The DV800 was their shot at doing it with authority. Instead of modifying an existing design, IH built this V8 from the ground up, focused entirely on raw power and the demands of heavy four-wheel drive tractors. And while the numbers looked impressive, what really mattered were the bold engineering choices that shaped everything from its performance to its reputation. The DV800 was a 90-degree turbocharged V8 with a displacement of 798 cubic inches, just shy of 13.1 liters. IH engineers gave it a 5.31-inch bore and 4.5-inch stroke, aiming for a balance between torque and higher operating RPMs. It used direct injection and ran a relatively aggressive 15.6 to 1 compression ratio. Supporting systems were just as heavy-duty. The engine held 30 quarts of oil and over 17 gallons of coolant, serious capacity for long shifts under heavy load. A large turbocharger helped force air through the big V8 at full throttle, and the engine was designed to maintain pulling power hour after hour. IH installed this engine in several of its four-wheel drive tractors, including the 4568, rated at 300 horsepower, and the 4586, also rated at 300 horsepower, and the later 4786, which used an uprated version of the same engine pushing closer to 350 horsepower. That put IH squarely in the big league horsepower race, going head to head with Versatile, Steiger, and anyone else running a Cummins or Cat. The DV800 was a dry sleeve engine, which, unlike IH's DT series with wet sleeves that could be rebuilt in frame, was chosen for its potential for better heat dissipation and more stable cylinder bores under high loads. That meant better ring seal and less oil consumption but it also meant repairs were more complicated and rebuilds couldn't be done in the field or in frame like a DT-466. The sound of the engine was something else entirely. A big V8 with a turbo and open exhaust didn't just run, it announced itself. It had a throaty, low-pitched roar that set it apart from the inline sixes farmers were used to. For some, it was music. For others, it was a reminder that this wasn't your everyday row crop machine. There's no question IH went big with this design. The numbers were impressive, the presence was commanding, and for a while, it looked like the company had a winner. But big specs are one thing, big reliability is another. And that's where the DV800 story starts to turn. When the DV800 hit the market, farmers expected a lot. And why wouldn't they? This engine checked all the boxes. High horsepower, 
turbocharged airflow, and a V8 growl that made the 4568 and 4586 look and sound like serious iron. For international harvester dealers, it was a talking point. For farmers running big acres, it looked like a new contender in the high horsepower race. And at first, there was some excitement. Farmers appreciated the raw power. The DV800 could absolutely pull. Paired with a four-wheel drive chassis and proper ballast, it handled wide implements with ease. In heavy tillage work, especially on the prairie or in spring plowing, it delivered strong torque and kept RPM steady. For those used to older six-cylinder diesels, the V8 had a completely different feel. It revved faster, it responded quicker, and it sounded like it meant business. But that's where the praise often stopped. The first thing many farmers noticed was that the DV800 wasn't easy to start, especially in cold weather. Even with functioning glow plugs and intake heaters, the engine could struggle to crank over and fire when the temperatures dropped. In some cases, Owners resorted to block heaters or even a whiff of either to get it going. Once running, it would smooth out, but on those early mornings, the engine felt stubborn. Then came the fuel consumption. The DV800 was thirsty. It took a lot of diesel to feed eight big cylinders, especially when they were all under load all day. On a per acre basis, many farmers found that they were burning noticeably more fuel than competitors running six-cylinder Cummins or Caterpillar diesels. For operations where margins were already tight, that became a real cost factor. The engine also had a tendency to feel out of place at lower RPMs. It tended to perform best at higher RPMs, north of 2000, where the turbocharger was fully effective. While continuous, high-speed, low-load operation wasn't typical for farm work, heavy tillage and pulling large implements often required sustained operation in this higher RPM range. The DV800 could thrive there. But when lugged down or run in lighter duty cycles, it didn't always feel as responsive or feel like it had as much torque as its inline six competitors. Operators also commented on vibration and cab noise. V8s naturally create more secondary vibration than inline sixes. And while the 4568 and 4586 cabs were solid for the time, the combination of engine noise, turbo whistle, and mechanical rumble could wear on the driver over a long day. It wasn't enough to call the tractors uncomfortable, but compared to the smoother, quieter power plants in deer and case machines, it was noticeable. And then there were the quirks. Small, nagging issues that showed up over time. Some farmers reported erratic idle behavior or occasional injector problems. Others struggled with heat buildup in the engine bay, especially during long days and hot weather. While these problems weren't universal, they were frequent enough to become part of the DV800's reputation. To be fair, not every DV800 failed. Plenty of farmers ran them hard for years and had few complaints, especially those who stayed on top of maintenance and didn't ask the engine to do something it wasn't built for. But over time, the consensus grew. The DV800 was a big engine that just didn't feel at home in farm work. It was better suited to earth movers and heavy trucks, machines that ran wide open, flat out for hours at a time. In short, the DV800 wasn't a total disaster in the field. It did what it was supposed to do, but it didn't do it with the grace or longevity of its rivals. And in a competitive decade where reliability and fuel efficiency were just as important as horsepower, just doing the job wasn't good enough. Ask any farmer who ran a DV800 and you'll probably hear the same thing. It could be a solid engine, if you stayed ahead of it. Maintenance wasn't optional. The DV800 demanded attention, and if it didn't get it, things could go downhill fast. Oil changes weren't just recommended, they were essential. The engine carried 30 quarts of oil and it ran hot under load. If the oil got dirty or started to break down, things like turbo seals, valve train components, and even rod bearings could start to suffer. Some operators extended intervals to save money and then paid the price later. Others stayed on schedule and had much better luck. The fuel system was another area that needed care. The DV800 ran direct injection with relatively tight tolerances for its day. And if injectors started to clog or the pump was even slightly out of tune, performance dropped off quickly. Some tractors developed a lope at idle or showed uneven power under load. 
These weren't catastrophic failures, but they were signs the engine needed a professional touch. And not every local shop was comfortable tuning a V8 farm diesel. Cooling was a weak point for some units, especially during the early years. The engine produced a lot of heat, and the big four-wheel drive tractors didn't always have the best airflow around the engine bay. Operators who neglected to flush the cooling system or clean out radiators often ran into overheating, particularly during hot summer field work. A few DV800s even developed warped heads or blown gaskets when temps got out of control, though that wasn't the norm for well-maintained machines. Then there was accessibility. Unlike IH's inline DT series engines, the DV800 wasn't easy to work on. Getting to injectors, turbos, or the back bank of cylinders took time. In-frame rebuilds weren't possible due to the dry sleeve design, which meant that once serious wear set in, the engine had to come out. For owners used to wrenching on their own machines, this was a major drawback. Vibration and wear were also long-term issues. V8s naturally produce more secondary vibration than inline engines, and over time that meant more stress on motor mounts, exhaust systems, and even cab hardware. Some operators reported chasing down cracked brackets, broken bolts, and loose fittings more often than they would have on a comparable six-cylinder machine. Still, not every DV800 had issues. Plenty of them cleared thousands of acres and lasted over 5,000 hours without a major teardown. But it was always conditional. If you kept it under 2800 RPM, kept the oil fresh, the fuel clean, the cooling system clear, and didn't lug it like a low-end torque monster, the engine could serve you well. The problem was that most farmers weren't looking for a high-maintenance power plant that required constant babysitting. They wanted something that started reliably, pulled hard, and didn't need to come out of the frame after five seasons. And by that measure, the DV800 often fell short. Not because it was poorly built, but because it asked more from the operator than most were willing or able to give. IH wanted to show it could compete with anyone, not just in tractors, but in the engines that powered them. Companies like Steiger and Versatile were buying their engines from proven names like Cummins and Detroit. IH wanted to go one step further and build its own. It was a bold move, and on paper, the DV800 looked like a serious contender. But in practice, it didn't pan out. While the engine could match the horsepower numbers, it couldn't match the field reliability, ease of service, or fuel economy of the competitors. For farmers staring down tight margins and long days in the field, that was a deal breaker. The DV800 didn't sink International Harvester on its own, but it didn't help. By the late 1970s, IH was already facing rising costs, labor disputes, and mounting pressure from every corner of the ag industry. What the company needed was a workhorse, something dependable and easy to maintain. Instead, it gave farmers a finicky, expensive-to-repair V8 that demanded constant attention. That showed up at the dealership level. Warranty work and downtime were costly, both in dollars and in reputation. Tractors like the 4568 and 4586, meant to be IH's high-horsepower flagships, too often ended up waiting on parts or mechanics who knew how to work on an engine that not every shop was equipped to deal with. Meanwhile, companies like John Deere, while not yet a dominant force in the articulated four-wheel drive market, were making steady gains in customer trust. Deere was refining the 466 engine, dialing in ergonomics with the Soundguard cab, and building tractors that ran for thousands of hours without drama. Even if their major four-wheel drive push came later, they weren't bleeding customers the way IH was. The DV800 came at a time when International Harvester couldn't afford to miss. The design was ambitious, the power was real, but the market wanted more than numbers, it wanted uptime. And in that regard, the DV800 fell short. It wasn't a failure because it broke down, it was a failure because it asked too much of the people who bought it. The DV800 didn't go out with a bang, it faded. As International Harvester edged toward its final years, the engine quietly disappeared from the company's tractor lineup. No major send-off, no redesign, no last hurrah. Just one more ambitious idea that didn't quite live up to its billing. But for all its shortcomings, the DV800 left a mark. 
it represented a critical turning point, not just for IH, but for how the industry thought about in-house engine development. The decision to build a proprietary V8 at a time when competitors were simplifying and standardizing power plants showed how far IH was drifting from what the market really wanted. While companies like Steiger were thriving by using proven, serviceable engines from Cummins and Caterpillar, IH bet on complexity and lost. The engine also forced a kind of reckoning within IH's customer base. Loyal farmers who had stuck with red iron through the 1066 and 1466 years suddenly found themselves second-guessing. They didn't mind learning how to fix things, but they wanted machines that rewarded that effort, not ones that fought them every step of the way. And yet, the DV800 is still remembered, sometimes with frustration, sometimes with a strange kind of respect. It wasn't lazy. It wasn't weak. It wasn't built cheap. It was overbuilt, overengineered, and overcomplicated. For farmers who kept up with it, the engine could deliver, but it was never going to be a universal solution. Today, a handful of 4568s and 4786s still turn heads at auctions and shows. Some have had their DV800s replaced with common swaps. Others still run the original engine, kept alive by patient owners who understand its quirks and limitations.